as to how I changed from an evolutionist to a creationist. It's a very difficult story for me to tell, and I always tell it very reluctantly. So if I stammer here in the beginning a little bit, you must excuse me as I get over it. I don't like digging it all up again. But there are occasions when it is important to show people how God has left, has led in, in one's life. And so I have to start the story with the very beginning. And maybe then from the background we can see why things happened as they happened. It is a strange story. Some of you might think that parts of it are incomprehensible or may even seem too, too strange to be true. But it did happen and it, and it is a fact that it happened like that and I cannot take it away. So I will tell it as it happened. At least what I remember of it. I was born in a, in a family where my mother was a very staunch, solid Lutheran. She was very faithful in her religion. And my father was a Roman Catholic. And he was very faithful in his religion as well. In those days, it was before the days of Vatican II, and uh, Protestants that were not Catholics were considered to be lost according to Roman Catholic doctrine. But in marriages between Protestants and Catholics, it was essential that the Catholic counterpart in that marriage was to promise that the children would be raised Catholic. And my mother accepted that, and she knew that I would be raised Catholic, and I was raised Catholic. And there was never any argument about religion in our house. My father and my mother respected each other. My father had a couple of problems with the church at one stage because of this marriage, but he, they overcame them, and then no problem concerning religion ever cropped up in our house. And when I was still quite young, I was about, about eight or seven years old, my mother became ill and she was diagnosed as having cancer. And they actually gave her a relatively short time to live. They said she would have about three to four months to live. But she was a very tough lady, and she managed to stretch that to about four years. She died when I was 12 years old. But those four years were very, very miserable years. She really suffered more than anybody else that I have personally been in contact with. She lost one part of her body after the other. They had to do mastectomies, and then they did took out part of her intestines, and she had to have colostomies. And eventually, she just lost more and more and more, and she had one operation after the other. They, in those days, they weren't as sophisticated as they are today. They burnt her under the radium treatment. They forgot her there. They had to peel off black pieces. So she really suffered tremendously. And through all this, she never, ever, ever gave up her faith. And I was very attached to my mother, but because of all the problems in the house and a mother that was on the verge of death for a long time, over a four-year period, there was also quite a bit of tension in the house. Now, while at school, I received religious instruction, of course. I was in a, in a Protestant, largely Protestant school. Uh, it was the German school. And I received religious instruction separately. The Catholics went to the nun, and she gave religious instructions. Now, I have met some very nice nuns in my life. And I've met nuns that are, are really gentle and soft people and are very nice to everyone around them. But this particular one, where I received religious instruction, was a very hard person according to my youthful experience that I had at that time. 
And she would constantly tell me that it was such a sad thing that my mother, who being Protestant, who would not see the kingdom of heaven, but that she would roast in hell forever and ever. And I resented this very much because I was very fond of my mother, particularly since she had such suffering in her life. And this carried on for about three years, four years, while my mother was sick. And the more it carried on, the more rebellious I became about the teachings that I was confronted with. I used to attend church very regularly. I had to go to church every Sunday with my father. I went through all the things like communion and all the things that, that Catholics do. And I became so resentful in the end that I used to be incredibly cheeky in the religious instruction class. And I was then thrown out of the class and told that I was to sit outside in the courtyard. And then for a few years I had living hell in that school because the headmaster was somehow in cahoots with, with all of this and whenever he spotted me, he used to thrash me. And uh, I used to take this quite well. I can be quite arrogant or I used to be very arrogant. Maybe not quite so much anymore, but if you bonks me on the bean, maybe the old man will surface. I don't know. I fight against him all the time. And he used to thrash me, and I, I remember distinctly I used to bend down, and he used to hit me once, two, three times, and I used to ask him, are you finished yet, or is your arm lame? What's the matter with you? <laughs> and he used to get so angry that he used to really whack me, and when he got to six, then I'd say, one more please, because then I can take you to court. You're only allowed to hit me six times. That's the law. So I wasn't very popular. <laughs> but the point arose where I was sitting in the class one day, in the religious instruction class again, and this lady, this nun, told me again that, uh, you know, people who were like we were, and particularly my mother, would go to hell forever and ever. And I got so angry I took the catechism book and I tore it and I threw it at her feet and I told her in not too kind a language, even for that age, what she could do with her God. And I was thrown out from that day on a permanent basis and I had to sit outside in the courtyard whether it rained or whether the sun shone. And my life in that school was an absolute misery. I never told my parents. Nobody ever knew what was happening. There was another teacher as well who used to call me to the front. Before the class even started, would you please come to the front? And I'd go and stand in the front and it hit me. Left, right and threw me out. So I was being thrown out out of two sessions on a regular basis. And I became an impossible child. I used to sit up in the trees when they come and look for me, the teachers, and I'd have these um, pine cones and I used to throw them. <laughs> oh boy, those were the days. In any case, my mother finally didn't make it when I was 12 years old and she died. And then from that time onwards, my home life totally disintegrated. My father married another lady who was a typical uh, stepmother, sort of a fairy tale stepmother. <laughs> she wouldn't have me around at all, and I was probably impossible, I will admit that. So I was carted off to hostels and uh, I wasn't allowed to then attend school either anymore. I was supposed to leave school and go into a trade. And uh, that's when I woke up and I decided, no ways, and I don't want to do this. So I managed to persuade some relatives and I went to another school. And I went through my school life and I did all right, not too hot, but not too, not too bad either. And then I went to the military and then finally to the university. But from the age of 12, I never 
trusted or believed in God at all anymore. As far as I was concerned, if he did exist, he was a dragon, and I wanted nothing to do with him. And when I came to university, there I studied science, and I studied zoology, and I thought this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And there I found out about the whole evolution theory, and I was at the university that was the bastion of evolution. Evolution was dished up for all meals. Every class had an evolutionary basis. And it's amazing because it was really, it started off as a religious university, and it has a big theology school, and yet the science faculty was incredibly secular, and in terms of its teachings, very, very evolutionary. They had some very important names in the listings of their professors, Robert Broom and people like that who had worked with the Taung skull, the human so-called ancestor, and our museums were full of these people, and I really got into the evolution theory, and I thought this was the answer to all the problems. While at the university, I had a roommate. I was in the hostel there, and uh, my roommate was a very nice guy, but he was very new age, even for that time. That's a long time ago. So to, the, the word new age wasn't even known at that time. And uh, he was into Scientology. You know the science of Scientology, where they put you on the e-meter and you, you go through your past lives and through all the problems that you had, and you clear your karma by talking it through and talking it out, and then eventually, well, then you become God and you've got it made. In any case, he became my best friend. And I had nowhere to go on weekends. I had nowhere to go during the holidays. I always had to work, put myself through university because my stepmother had convinced my father that he mustn't pay anything, so I put myself through. I had a great relationship with my father years later, so that'll come right, as you can see. Even the worst situations can come right. And on holidays, I didn't know what to do, so I used to go home with this chap to where he lived, 2,000 kilometers away, in another city called Durban. And every holiday, I used to go home with him, because I had no home to go to. And there, I met my current roommate, my wife, who happened to be his sister. Far better roommate than he ever was, I'll tell you. <laughs> and I have to tell you a little bit about her background. Now you know why I was an atheist, I didn't believe anything, I accepted the evolution theory, it was the answer to all my problems. Now her background was entirely different. Her father worked in his younger days for a newspaper, and he was sent to investigate all the strange occult occurrences in the country. So he worked for this newspaper and he had his team and his infrared cameras and all the stuff that you need, and he toured the country from one strange occurrence to the other. He was very skeptical, he believed nothing, he thought it was a big joke, and seances were a big joke and a big fake. And as he attended one meeting after the other, he realized that this was no joke. When he started investigating some of the strange events and he put up a camera, at one, and one seance he was putting up cameras and he was always looking underneath for hidden mics and what have you, and something grabbed him, there was nobody that grabbed him, but something grabbed him and beat him up to such an extent that he had an egg-sized boil on the top of his head and was lucky to get away with it with his life. Now when that happens to you, you start thinking, well, <laughs> there was some hidden microphone that did that. <laughs> and he came into situations which were so strange that he became involved in them later. Situations like uh, a house where when the little child had been sent to bed, the shoes would come walking through the room. And another situation where a newborn baby used to scream hysterically, and when the parents came in, they'd always used to find the baby on top of the cupboard, newborn baby, out of the cot, on top of a cupboard, and they'd walk up and just manage to save the child as it fell down. 
Now he went to that house and he sealed every single window and he had his guards outside because he thought, you know, somebody was playing the fool. And he kept the lock and he waited there. And sure enough, the child screamed and he went in. And there the child was on top of the cupboard and he just caught it as it fell down. There was other occasions when in a certain house human excrement was flying around. And he sat in this house and it started howling and the human excrement started flying against all the walls. Strange, strange occurrences. Witchcraft of the worst kind. There was one house that was plagued by a baboon that used to come in and tear everything apart. That's a big ape. And it tore everything apart and it terrorized this family and they could never catch it. And then one day they shot this baboon as it came in and it ran out and the blood trail ended up on the, on the veranda outside. And as they came out, the blood trail ended and there lay one of the workers dead. So this was typical African witchcraft as you find it uh, in Africa, in some places even today still. And this convinced him that there definitely was something going on and he got into... Uh, seances more deeply and then he started learning that you know there were higher uh, mediums and lower mediums the riffraff mediums for the for the lower people the higher mediums who communicated with the better spirits and this is how he became involved in this type of thing and then eventually he moved into the new age sort of movement and became very high up in this sort of agenda. He wrote books on it and uh, he was very well received in those circles. Later on, later in life, my wife's parents got divorced and he married a person, a, a lady, who was also very, very high up in the New Age movement. In fact, she is one of the instructors in the Course of Miracles. She teaches people how to become Christ's and to perform miracles. Incredibly evil situations sometimes in that house and uh, the, the occurrences that happened in my, my wife's house as a, as a child were very strange indeed. They would have one chair where there was always someone sitting breathing heavily and they had a cane that used to go a walking and a rattling and sort of things like that. She grew up with this situation. To her it was nothing. She was used to it. Now to me it was very strange and I was an atheist. I didn't believe anything. I, you know, I tried to rationalize it in a scientific sense. And then when my wife and I got married, we moved to the city where I was in the university. And for years there was no real problem. And then my wife, uh, we had first the first child, the second child, and then the youngest child my wife was expecting when my father-in-law came to visit. And uh, he moved in into an outside flat that we had, an apartment, and there he stayed with us. Now thinking back, I know that this is where it all started. Because if you have an occult presence, then you will have this influence on your home for a long time. I can perhaps tell you that when we were just married, we moved to very close to them, and there were very, very strange occurrences in our house. Absolutely horrendous occurrences on some occasions. Our dishes would fly through the rooms and smash against the walls, and things like that. Or you'd park the car and the car would rock and f fall over against the side of the garage. We had very strange happenings in, on a previous occasion. But you forget about those things and you, and later on you rationalize them as well and you say they didn't exist or they were strange. When my wife was expecting this last child, when my father-in-law moved in, she became very ill indeed so ill that we didn't think that she would survive. And she was in hospital, in and out of hospital, and on a respirator, and she was very, very sick. And then we decided that 
there must be something wrong with this pregnancy and the doctors had a look at it and they said that the best thing to do would to be to have an abortion because the child was probably dead. They didn't have a scanner at that stage in those hospitals so they couldn't tell properly and uh, they didn't know whether this child was perhaps dead. So we decided that we'd have to transfer to another place where they could do a scan, which we then did. And she was very ill, she had a very high temperature, and they did the scan, and this little fetus was only about so big, and he was perfectly well, and he was sucking his thumb, and we decided that we weren't going to do this, we were going to sit through it and see what happened. And eventually, through nine months of hell, and of sickness and coughing, and more in hospital than out of hospital, uh, my wife was discharged, the child was born, and this child was the most miserable child that you can imagine. He was impossible. He used to scream from morning till night. If you wanted to feed him, you had to wrap him round and round in a blanket so that he couldn't move his arms or else he'd claw and scratch at you while he was trying, while you were feeding him. And if you put him to bed, he would scream and scream and scream. And so we had a technique where you sort of sit there and rock and rock and rock the bed until he finally falls asleep. Then you sneak off to bed and you try and fall asleep and the minute you sleep he screams again. And this carried on for, for months. It was absolutely chaotic. And nothing you could do could console this child. My wife was a wreck, I was a wreck, we were all totally destroyed. And then, one night at two o'clock, I had a dream that I was being strangled. And it was so vivid that I woke up with this perspiration falling down my face and my heart was pounding like some drum inside me and I sat upright and tried to recover from this terrible nightmare and the next moment the little one in the next room screamed as if he was being murdered and my wife and I got such a fright we stormed out of bed ran to this little baby picked him up and as we picked him up, he started shaking violently. And his temperature would rise and then he'd go into fever cramps. And so we rushed him off to hospital. And they had a look at him and they had to put him in a refrigeration tent. They had a tent sort of that's cooled. And put him on a drip and then it would be touch and go whether he would live or whether he would die. And he'd recover from this and come back home, as impossible as he was before. And it would go fine for about two, three, four weeks. I can't remember what the gap was in between. And then precisely two o'clock at night, exactly two o'clock, it was uncanny. We had a, uh, a clock on our bed and it was a, a display clock so you could see exactly 1400 hours and two o'clock, whatever it was, two o'clock in the morning, that's when I woke up with this terrible feeling that I was being strangled. And I shake my wife and said, I've just had that terrible dream again. And then the little one would scream in the next room and we'd run and we'd pick him up and the same thing would happen. It was so bad that we would think that we wouldn't make it to hospital, the child would die. There was nothing you could do as soon as he started the screaming, his temperature would just rise. And it would just go so high that he would fall unconscious. Eventually they, be, they got to know us so well that the hospital had this place prepared for him whenever it was necessary. <laughs> they didn't know what was the matter with him. They could never find out. On one occasion, the doctor said they have to do a lumbar puncture because there must be something wrong with his cerebrospinal fluid, maybe he has some brain infection that is causing this. And I remember taking him to this hospital, and he was just a baby, and afterwards he screamed so that my wife became quite hysterical. When the doctors came out, they said, this is incredible. There were four adults that had to hold this child down 
He was less than a year old and their four adults had to hold him down because he was plucking them around. So this little chap was, if anything, definitely very much possessed. And you can rationalize it if it happens once and you can rationalize it if it happens twice. But if it keeps on happening for weeks and months on end, that at precisely two o'clock you have an experience in one room and then immediately thereafter there's a scream in another room, then the law of statistics tells you that no matter how atheistic you are and no matter how scientific you try and be about this issue, the two incidences are connected. And I was sitting in the hospital one day, my wife and I took turns to be with the little one and he was in a very bad state and it had happened for the umpteenth time and there I was in the hospital and I was marking papers, I remember it as if it were yesterday, I was marking and all of a sudden in this refrigeration tent this child started shaking and he started getting one of these attacks and fits in his bed. So I went and ran and called the nurse and we, I picked him up and he shook so that he tore the drips out. Now this child had been on so many drips that they couldn't find the veins anymore on his arms or on his legs so they had to put it into the veins here on the head and he shook so that they tore out. Now I've got this child in his fit and I've got this child with his thing torn out and he tore the vein completely so the blood was running down his face. And it was such a horrible sight that uh, I went crazy. I couldn't handle this. And eventually he calmed down and they put him back in the tent and they got the drip back in and, and he managed to survive the night. But that night I sat there and I said to myself, what can I do? There is no medical help. Nothing can help us. And the two incidences must be connected. Where do I find help for this situation? And they tell me, once a Catholic, always a Catholic. And as I was sitting there that night in that hospital, mulling over these things, you know, the images of the Catholic Church and its power over, over demons and the film The Exorcist was just in circuit. And I thought to myself, perhaps I can go back to my old church and ask them to help me. So I made a resolution that I would do that because I had no other way out. And the next day I went to the Catholic Church and the Catholic priest was sitting in his room and I remember this as well too, he had the glass there and there was a brandy bottle there and he didn't, he wasn't too sober. <laughs> and I went up to him and I said to him, you know, uh, I'm a Roman Catholic but uh, I don't come to church and uh, I have a problem. And he said, well, what is your problem? He was very nice. And I said to him, well, you know, I'm, I'm an atheist and I'm a scientist. I don't want to talk about this thing like it. And I sort of ummed and ahed and I said, Yo, you know, mm, mm, well, I have a problem at home. He says, well, what kind of problem? I said, well, it's a problem concerning strange happenings in my home. And he says, oh, no, 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 I want nothing to do with that. <laughs> and he said, it's not my field. Give me your name, give me your telephone number, we'll come back to you. So I gave him my name and my telephone number. All I'd said was, I have strange happenings in my home, that's it. And I went home and I thought, well, that was a lot of help, thank you very much. And I wasn't home very long when I got a call from another priest. And this one sounded very sophisticated. And he told me whether I would like to meet him at a monastery nearby. So I went to the monastery and there was this old man. And he was so impressive. He really made such a powerful impression upon me. He told me to sit down and then he started to tell me what the problem in my home was. And my mouth fell open. If there was a fly it would have gone straight in. <laughs> he told me there was a problem in my house that Satan was trying to kill my son 
and that uh, we were being terrorized. And I said to them, but how, that's it, that, that's impossible. How do you know that? I never said anything to anyone. He says, never mind how I know. I also know, he said, that the problem in your home is so severe that it will take the highest levels of action in order to get rid of it. And we will also have to say a mass in your house. And then he said to me, it is illegal for me just to say a mass in any house. To say a mass in a private house, I need to have permission from the bishop. And I already have it. Here it is. And there was the signed permission from the bishop to say a mass in my house. He knew beforehand what was going to happen. He knew beforehand that he needed the permission. And everything was arranged before I even told them what the problem was. Now that blew me out of the water. Then I said to him, fair enough, then you can come to my house and you can do whatever you have to do. But I have a problem in that I was an, or am an atheist and I haven't been to the church and now you're going to say mass and all these things in my house and you know, I've been a bad boy all these years. And he said, but uh, surely you won't be an atheist anymore. And I said, what about my wife? She's not even Catholic. She's Dutch Reformed. He says, no problem. So he came and he spoke to my wife, and my wife was as impressed as I was, very impressed. And he said, take me through the house. And we went through the house, and when we got into the little one's room, all of a sudden, he started falling around. And he couldn't stand anymore, this old man. And I stood there behind him, and I, and I was sort of doing this behind him, you know, like they do at, on the stage in some of these ministries where the guys fall out and they don't know which way they're going to fall. <laughs> well, it happened there as well, and here he was, shaking and perspiring and, and really being battered. And eventually it calmed down, and we went to the other rooms, and then we came into our bedroom, and he was thrown around again, but not as bad as in the little one's room. And then he said to me, the little one's room is the worst place in your house. Now we have to exercise your entire house. Bring me some water. We brought him some water. And then he took out special salt, which he said was very special exorcism holy salt. And he made the sign of the cross with the salt in the water. And then he also told me that he had a special ring with him which had the relics of a particular saint that was potent in terms of exercising. And he, this priest, had been an exorcist for the Roman Catholic Church in many countries. He was Irish. And then he took this bowl of holy water that he had made and he went to every single window and door in the house. And he took it and he put a cross on the windows. And of course, as it evaporates, you have this faint cross of salt on your windows. And he went through the entire house with this holy water, and then he put the holy water down. And he said, now we tell the Mass here in this child's room. And he prepared everything. And as he was preparing... We had lots of pets in our house. We had a dog and two cats and you name it, all the good stuff that one has when one has kids in the house. And as he was preparing, all of a sudden, all the animals came running into this room. And there they sat. And I looked at this and I said, well, this is weird. What's going on here? And he told, did the mass. And then he, before he left, he said, what you have to do now is above every child's bed, you have to put the following. And he took out of his pockets amulets from Lourdes, where Mary had appeared. And he gave an amulet from Lourdes. He said there were many fake ones. This was the real thing. And we had to put it above each child's bed. And then he did an amazing thing. He took his ordination cross off. And he gave it to me and he said, 
This one you put over the little one. I hate it when the devil destroys little children. And we hung it up over there, and my wife was giving pottery classes at the Technicon at that time, and she'd made a very beautiful pot, and so she decided to give it to him as a gift, because how do you pay for what he did? I mean, what do you do? So she gave this to him as a gift, and he said, this gift is so precious, I'm going to give it to the nuns that are in a certain monastery that where they never ever come out and see civilization. And then he left. And that night, we're very expectant. We take this little child, and he's quite happy, really, not screaming as usual. And we take him and we tell him it's time for bed. Now normally that was enough to have blue murder in the house. And he was quite happy. And we put him into this bed. Now he was only just, just starting to toddle. And we put him into the bed. And this child had always, when you put him into bed, gone into a fetal position and started bashing away and screaming and going blood red and going totally crazy. That night we put him into the bed and he rolled onto his back and laughed. And he put his arms out like that and he did goo goo sounds like little kids do and he fell asleep. And for the first time in his life he slept right through the night. And the next night he slept right through the night. And the next night and the next night and the next night and the next week and the next month. And here was I the hard-nosed atheist scientist who knows it all, and here was peace and quiet in my house. And then I realized that I do not know it all at all. And I said to myself, now what am I going to do? Here is a major problem in my house, and the church solves the problem. Now, am I going to ignore it? Or am I going to say, there is a God, and I have a responsibility towards this God? And I wrestled with this for a number of months. I really wrestled with it. And my wife wrestled with it. And then I said, well, I have no choice. I have to go back to the church. Fortunately, my oldest son was at the point where he has to go to communion classes, so that gave me an alibi to go to church. So I went to church and this one or two students, it's a small university town, so I say, what are you doing here? I say, well, my son has to go to communion, you see. <laughs> and I started going to church and I became quite involved in the church again. Every Sunday, faithfully, everybody went to church. And my wife started saying that this is the way to go. She also wants to go to church, but she didn't get herself quite that far yet. And because there was so such peace and harmony in the house, we became more relaxed. And one day I was sitting there and I thought to myself, you know, this house needs a change. And typical German, I thought, said to my wife, you know, if we did this and that and the other, then, you know, we could do something with this house. And I climbed into the roof and looked what was a bearing wall and what was not a bearing wall, and then I just took a sledgehammer and smashed out everything that irritated me. And we decided to restructure the whole house, which we did. I managed to get accumulate some money, and I wasn't in a, in a great problems. And then we redid our entire house. And during the process, I had to go and see a man for the kitchen, I wasn't really involved in the church yet. I'm sort of in the stage of, uh, I don't really know, but. And the man who did the kitchen came and said to me, by the way, I walk with the Lord. And I still remember distinctly thinking, oh brother, another one who walks with the Lord. <laughs> and I said to him, okay, that's fair enough. You walk with the Lord. I was very cheeky. You walk with the Lord, but I just want the kitchen. Is that okay? And he said, yeah, okay, that's okay, but can I give you this? And he gave me a pamphlet. And, well, he was a nice guy, and, you know, I stood with the pamphlet, uh, and I put it in a drawer, and I said, well, I'll read it later. And then he put the kitchen in, the house was finished, and when this was all done, I started going back to the church. 
And this carried on for a period of one year. And I faithfully went to church regularly. And I always sat there on a Sunday morning and I marveled at all the things that I knew were happening in the Catholic Church. I went through the catechism again as my son went through the catechism. And I wondered at the same ritual happening every time. You know, the host going up, the change from, from bread to divinity, the little box with the red light where God was. And I started puzzling as to why God wanted the same things over and over again. And why he was satisfied with the same ritual over and over again. But I was convinced this was the truth. I was convinced Catholicism was God's representative on this earth because it had solved the problem in my home. But I wanted to get to know this God. And I wanted to know what it's like to have a relationship with this God. And I looked at the, at the charismatic movement where they had the slaying in the spirit and I thought to myself, isn't that perhaps the experience that one must have in order to know that this God really exists because I don't really feel him, I don't know where he is. But on the other hand, I'd always been so skeptical of this and I'd always said to myself, these people with their religious crutch. And then one day, I was sitting in class and I was giving a lecture to a first year group of students. I'd spoken to the, to the priest, by the way, about evolution and the Catholic Church said to me, of course there's evolution, there's no problem with that. So I had no problems with that either. I could carry on with my evolution and now believe in God. It was quite a nice arrangement. And I was in a first year class and I was giving a lecture with a very heavy evolutionary base. And a young girl got up in a first year class. Now that takes courage. 300 first year students and a young girl gets up in my class. And she says, excuse me. And I say, yes, what's your problem? And she says, what you are saying is against my beliefs. What you are saying is a lie. I believe that God created the heavens and the earth. He is the creator of the universe. Well, I nearly exploded. I destroyed her. I ridiculed her. I finished her off. She sat down and she cried in my class. And I thought, well, job well done. And then the class was over and all the students were very impressed at all the eloquence I'd put onto the onto the board and prove to them what a ridiculous idea this was that this young girl had postulated. And I went back and sat in my office and then there was a question earlier about conscience. Do you remember it? Well, this little voice here wouldn't let me go and kept on telling me what a mean son of a gun I was. And how could I, in front of everyone, attack and humiliate this young girl to such an extent? And I felt really bad about myself. My conscience wouldn't let me go. And I didn't know how to handle this. So typical Catholic way, I thought, well, on the way home for lunch, I wouldn't stay far from the university, so I always went home for lunch. I'll go by the Catholic church and sit there for a while, and hopefully the feeling will go away. <laughs> so I drove past, and I went into the church, and I sat inside, and it was locked the door was open, you could come to a few pews, but around the altar it was locked because thieves had been stealing. And I sat there and I spoke to God and I looked at the little red light, which means that the host was present there, so God was present. And it struck me that he was locked up in that little box. <laughs> and then I sat there for a long while and I was tortured in my soul. I really, I was tortured. And I said to myself, do you know, God must be here because he did such wonderful things in my home. My family is totally different. My wife was willing to be converted. I'd called the Catholic priest to our home so that she could become a Catholic. And for some reason, he just never made it. He never made it. He always had something on, but he was still going to come. And I sat in that church and I wrestled with God and I told him that I have all these feelings and I don't know where he is and I've never really met him. 
And I know that in other churches all these exciting things happening and here, you know, we have the same thing every Sunday and where are you? And I sat there in the pew and I said, okay, God, if you really exist, then now you must show me because I really cannot find you. And with that feeling I went home, feeling a bit better. And typical me, I was home quickly and then I started rummaging in the drawer. I was looking for something and uh, all of a sudden as I rummaged in this drawer, I pick up this pamphlet. This is now a year after this man who was walking with the Lord gave me this pamphlet. And I pick up this pamphlet and I start reading it. It was in German and it had three columns. It had the law of God on the one column and it had the law according to the Catholic Church and it had the law according to the Lutheran Church. And then it explained how the commandments had been changed by the church and it had the Bible texts of how it had been changed. And I thought to myself, now what rubbish is this? This is absolute garbage. And I said to my wife, wife, I didn't say that, I called her by her name. I said, have we got a Bible in the house? And she said, no, I don't think so, I don't think there's a Bible. I said, surely there must be a Bible in the house. We've been going for church for, for almost a year now and there's no Bible in the house. There were lots of catechism books in the house. So I grabbed the catechism book and opened it up and looked and sure the commandments as on the pamphlet were identical to those in the catechism book. And then I remembered an old box that a, a, an old lady that had died had left me. And I put it in the garage after having sorted out some of the things. And I remembered there were a whole lot of books and I knew that little old ladies probably would have Bibles. So I went outside in the garage, rummaged in this box, and sure enough, here was an old Bible, an old German Bible. So I went inside and opened it up, and there it was. The Ten Commandments were totally different to what they were in the Catechism book. And this puzzled me. So after one year, I phoned this cabinet maker, and I said to him, Remember me a year ago, you put a kitchen in for me. He says, you know what? I've been trying to phone you all day. I had this feeling I must phone you, but I don't know why. What's the matter? I said, will you please come round? You left me a pamphlet that I want to talk to you about it after one year. And he came round, and he was a nice guy. And we started talking. And then we started talking about the scriptures and about the Bible. And we started talking about the book of Daniel and the prophecies pertaining to Daniel chapter 7, and I went through it with him, and we wrote, and we worked till about 3 o'clock in the morning. And he came the next day and the next day, and in three days we'd gone through Daniel and Revelation, all the historic facts and all these things, and I wouldn't believe a word of it. And then I decided that the only way we're going to resolve this is if I check whether every one of those facts is really so whether those kingdoms and those kings and all these things are really so. So I went back to the university, to the history department, the theology department. I got everything that I could lay my hands on and I checked and verified and it was really so. And then I started finding out that the little horn of Daniel chapter 7, if you take it as the Bible says, can be none other than the Roman Catholic Church. What a shock that was to my system. Then I got the Protestant view of the little horn being Antiochus Epiphanes IV, and I went through all of that and found out that it can't be him because none of the criteria fit. And I also how the scripture had been changed on some of these points. But to be fair, I invited the Roman Catholic priest to my home. And I said, would you please come to my home? I have to talk to you on an issue. And he came. And my wife was there and I was there. And I took the Bible, and I took the chapters in Daniel, and I went through with him, with it in detail, and I showed him the change of the commandments and all these things. And then he said to me, I can't talk to you on this issue because I'm not into scripture at all. <laughs> and I was stunned. Here was a priest and he was not into scripture. He says, we have some specialists who are into scripture. But uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to me, he says. And then he left. 
And then I had the ministers of other churches, and we argued right sometimes till the late hours of the night as to what the little horn was. And every time they come back to Antiochus Epiphanes, I'd show them, but it can't be because he comes after Rome, etc. It can't be in Greek times. And eventually they would all leave as well and say it can't be any other way. So I was confronted with this tremendous dilemma. And then the worst thing of all was we started talking about the Sabbath, this other man and I. And we went through the whole Sabbath thing. And then I said to him, but this is ridiculous. How can you keep a commandment which you keep because the Lord created in six days the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is? That's ludicrous. Everything came into existence through evolution. And he said, no. It came into existence through creation. God created it. You know, and the little girl pops up into my mind. And I said to him, but that's rubbish. He says, I'll prove it to you. I said, you try. And he tried. The next day he was at my house with a pile of books like this. All on creationism. And he gave them to me. And I remember going through those books. I was sitting in my office. I used to give my class and run back. And I went through those books very quickly. And I gave them back to him in a very short time period and said, they're your books. And he says, what do you think? I said, I've never read so much garbage in all my life. So he said, don't worry, and he brought me another pile like that. <laughs> and I went through that lot, and it was so confusing and so full of garbage. So I gave it back to him. And I said, it's so unscientific, I cannot accept this. So we argued about God being a creator or not a creator, and I would kill him with science. I had all the terminology. I was a lecturer. I was an evolutionist. I knew what to tell these people. I've been trained to wipe out people who oppose, you know, the scientist on any of these fields. And he got so frustrated with me. And then one day he was so frustrated, he says, you know what? I said, what? He says, I haven't got a problem with evolution creation. You have a problem. You solve it. <laughs> so there the ball was in my court. In the meantime, things were happening again in my house. The little one would again become miserable every time it was time for bedtime. He again became grouchy and screaming and what have you. And we also noticed that whenever we had a moment of peace, my wife and I, we, we studied the scriptures like, I cannot tell you how we studied it. I finished a Bible. In two months I had to throw it away. It was finished. It fell apart. And my wife was studying. And she was, had tremendous problems with the Sabbath idea. It made no sense. It was so stupid. And nobody at work knew what was happening with me. And one day I came to work and my, the secretary in the department came up to me and said, I've got something for you to read. And she handed me a pile about so thick of documents. And when I looked at them in, my, in a spare moment, I saw that it was a long piece of writing against the Sabbath. And it was written against Seventh-day Adventists. And this stunned me because nobody at work knew what was happening with me. I mean, a scientist would never admit, you know, that he's now talking about and thinking about religion. That was ridiculous. My, my colleagues were all atheists. And I took this and I thought to myself, now what am I going to do with this? I haven't got time with this. I'm wrestling with evolution. So I gave it to my wife. And I said, yeah, here's fodder. You go through this. Maybe there's a way out of all this. And she meticulously went through every statement. It was really a thick, thick thing written against it. And while I was wrestling with evolution, she was wrestling with that. And then one day she said to me, you know, I've been through every single statement they have. And every single one I've put it next to the Bible. And every time this is the word of man and the Bible has something else to say. So this document here has now convinced me that the Sabbath must be right. That was something. So a document written against the Sabbath proved to her that the Sabbath was actually very important and right. But I still had a problem. 
a major problem. I couldn't accept it because I'm not going to keep a day for creation that took six billion years, let alone six days. And the ball was in my court, and at that stage, everything started going wrong again in my house. And we, when we picked up the Bible, the little one would go hysterical. Whenever we had a spare moment, he would go hysterical. And eventually, he took a bottle of wine, we'd been drinking wine, and he smashed it. I wasn't in the room at the time, but I just heard the glass breaking. And then we came out and he was walking all over the glass. And his feet were cut to shreds. His big toe was almost severed. So back to hospital, they sewed the toe back on. And it was a nightmare from then onwards in our house. And I was wrestling with the Sabbath issue, Sabbath issue. And I stood in the library one day. We had the biggest evolution-based library in the Southern Hemisphere at that university. And I said to myself, you know, there must be a solution. And I said in my mind, God, if there is something wrong with this theory of evolution, then I haven't found it yet, then you must show me. Because nobody else can show me. And I went into this library, took out a book, and as I walked out the door, a colleague stopped me and he said, hold it, there's another book you must take, which is the same book as that one, but the new edition, it's come, it's on the back shelf. Oh, very strange. So I went to the back and I took that edition as well. I took them both and I went to my office. And then I started reading. But I started reading them both at the same time. And then as I looked at the one, the old edition would say that there is a major problem with the cetaceans, with the whales, because they appear suddenly in the fossil record fully formed. And there is no evidence that the one gave rise to the other. The new edition would couch it all in scientific, not scientific terminology, would say cetaceans have an ancient origin and evolved from such and such to such and such and such and such and such and such. And I went through them, one model after the other, and the old one would admit to the problem, the new one would never admit to the problem. And that's when I started thinking, wait, there's something wrong here. There's something fishy here. And whenever I went into the library, it was if some miracle would happen. I would take out something, and the very next thing I would take would be exactly the opposite on the same issue. And very quickly, I had a big pile. And then I started, I was giving classes at that time in genetics, and I started thinking about this. And then I started working out this genetic thing, and uh, much as like we did over here, and I started thinking about what are the problems. Let me now objectively, just for once, sit down and think, what are the problems? And I came up with such a pile of problems that it stunned me. And something must have been helping me, because the problem list was so enormous it was unbelievable. And then one night I was sitting at home and I was, child was impossible, he went to bed and we went to bed, two o'clock at night I had a dream. I was being strangled. And the little one screamed in the next room and we ran and the same thing happened. But he didn't get so sick that he had to go to hospital. He just got a very high fever and we could handle it somehow at home. And then I contacted this other person and I said to him, Do you know there's something very strange here. I, I know that from the scriptures, the system, the Roman Catholic system, cannot be God's system. And yet, we had this problem, and I didn't want to tell him about it. And then in the end, I half told him about it, but not completely. And he said, don't worry, we'll pray. And it stopped. And then a week later, it happened again, at two o'clock. And what had happened, unbeknown to me, he had gotten a number of people together and told them to pray at two o'clock every night get up. And they set their alarms judiciously and got up at two o'clock and prayed for a family they didn't even know. And there was total quiet in which we could really study our Bibles in peace and quiet. And then one night, one of the ladies had decided that, you know, it was quiet. Why must she get up? And she didn't get up. And it happened. Now, thinking back on it, God doesn't need the prayer of that one little individual. But there were lessons in it that would later be important to, to me. That God wants unity amongst his people. 
and everybody must stand together on an issue. So it was a lesson for them as well as a lesson for us. And then it came to the point where I knew that I cannot sit on the fence forever. Either this is the truth, and I'd studied it and I'd verified it, I'd had lecturers talk with me on the Greek meaning of this and the Hebrew meaning of that, I verified the historic facts, I'd looked at the prophecies, there was no other way in which it made any logical sense whatsoever. I studied what the other churches had said, it didn't make sense. And I knew a decision would have to be made. There was no way out. And I decided I was going to do it. I was going to make the decision. No matter how ostracized and how weird this church was to me, the first time my wife saw Adventist, she burst into tears. They ate so strange. They, they were so different to what we were like. I remember the man said to me, don't you want to come to one of our services? And I said, that's Sunday. That's my day off. I walk around in jeans and a t-shirt and slops. And I'm not going to any church whatsoever if I can't go exactly like I am. Because if I went to the Catholic church, I went in jeans and t-shirt and slops. He said, that's fine. Come. So I went to the Catholic church, I mean to the Adventist church and I sat there in the back and I looked at all these people with their suits and their ties and I thought, yuck. <laughs> and they all looked at me, but they were all pleasant about it. And strange things like that. And I, I, I didn't like the setup. I didn't like what they looked like. They looked so different to everyone else, you know. My friends were rough and they were... They would make coarse jokes and all kinds of things, and these were so different. My wife burst into tears when she saw this. She said, I don't want that lifestyle. I want my old lifestyle. We used to sit around the swimming pool and drink beer and tell, have friends over and, you know, have parties and stuff like that. And they were so different. It's so night and day difference that you think you could never be happy over there. She cried and cried and cried, but knew somehow she'd have to go back in any case. And then one day I decided that I couldn't take it anymore at work with all this evolution teaching. And another strange thing happened. I was asked by the then head of the department to lead a evolution discussion group with the postgraduate students about two weeks later. Everybody gets a turn, but mine wasn't for months. Something happened and mine was moved forward. Now I sat with a major problem. Do I go into that with my mouth full of teeth, pretending to be what I am not? Or do I stand up and for what I now believed? And I was really so chicken. It's unbelievable. I was so scared of this event. To lose face amongst your colleagues when you've been such a bee's knees all these years, it's really a painful experience. And I decided after much wrestling and soul searching that I would do it. My new friends who had become less weird in my eyes over time would pray for me while I did this. And I went into that lecture hall and the whole staff was sitting there. This was a postgrad affair, so the whole staff was there and all the postgraduate students. And I start the ball rolling with a lecture normally and then you start this evolutionary discussion group. And I started the lecture and then I switched to the genes and I highlighted every single problem. And I went through the whole gene system as far as I'd sorted it out at that stage. And I said at the end, therefore, evolution is not possible. Well, first you could hear a pin drop, and then all hell broke loose. One of my colleagues went blood red and started screaming at me like you cannot believe, and the foam literally started coming out of his mouth with rage. It was just unbelievable. And then one of the students, a girl, it's interesting how these things happen, a young student, a girl, an honor student, she got up and she said, I want to say something. And she looked at all the lecturers 
And she said, when I came to this university, I believed in God, I had a good life, I had a good relationship with God, and now I believe nothing anymore. I've lost my faith, my life is falling apart, and you have robbed me of my faith. And now Dr. Fight is giving this lecture and showed me now that you had been misleading me. Can you imagine what happened in that department? <laughs> that was the end. My life was not worth one cent in terms of my scientific credibility. I was finished. When I walked down the passage, my colleagues would turn around and walk the other way. And I decided there and then that it was impossible for me. Then we had a meeting a special meeting where they decided that the basis of all teaching must be evolution. And of course, I couldn't go along with that, so I decided I would resign. So I resigned, and the head of the department said, you know, you can't just do this. I mean, I had a lot of students, and I was quite popular amongst the students. And I had most of the postgraduate students were under my supervision. And then the rector of the university called me in. And the rector said, I must come to him. And I thought to myself, wow, now I must go to the rector. What do I do? I've got nothing decent to wear. I've never possessed a suit in my life. I bought the suit to go and see the rector. Can you believe that? <laughs> and when I put on the stupid suit to look at, to go and visit the rector, something struck me between the eyes like, like a hammer blow. It's just a personal thing for me. I thought to myself, now look what you're doing, you idiot. You go and put on a suit to go and speak to a man, but when you go to visit God, you go in jeans and a t-shirt. <laughs> Purely a personal thing. I don't mind anybody coming to church in jeans and t-shirts. That's fine. It's just for me personal. And that bugged me. And then I went to the rector's office and I sat there opposite the rector and we started talking. And he talked with me for one hour. And it was very difficult for the university to, to, you know, get rid of me because I had all these students. And we started talking and talking and then eventually he said, you know, what if you decided that you do not rock the boat anymore? Then, you know, we could give you something better? Well, that would be a professorship. I was a pretty young guy, I would just about be the youngest professor in the university. And uh, I looked at him and I said to him, the price is too high. And I will leave in any case. And then he says, that's very interesting. By the way, who do you think has the truth? And there I sat, my mouth full of teeth. Do I admit that I believe that some little sect that everybody detests has the truth? And do I say this to a man who has this high position in this university and in the government at large? And I said to him, well, uh, well, you know, religion, Christ, the churches, uh, whatever. I can't even remember what I said. And he said to me, no, 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 that's not what I want to know. I want to know from you who do you say has the truth? Uh, 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 we went through the same ritual again. And he stopped me and he says, no, 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 I don't want to know that. I want to know from you, who do you think has the truth? And I started off with this again and in the back of my mind I heard this terrible cock crowing. <laughs> Three times I thought, ah. Oh. And I said to him, well, I think it's the Seventh-day Adventist church that, has, that is preaching the truth. And I thought, now that's it, I'm a dead man. <laughs> and he said nothing, not a word. He just said, oh, well, thank you very much. Congratulations on your choice and I hope things go well with you. And that's it. And I've resigned from the university. 
And I put my house on the market and the very first guy that walked into my house said, wow, what a house, and he bought it. The very first guy. And there I had this money and I knew now my scientific credibility in the world was over. University was a career that I'd given up for my faith and God would take care of me from now on and things are going to be just honky-dory. I'm going to now take this money and we're going to do something great with it. We're going to start a little uh, farm somewhere and we're going to get people to come and we're going to witness and we're going to do great things with all this money. And I got some guys together and we started this thing. And then we planted wheat and the wheat grew like crazy. And it stood so high that the farmers in the entire district came and said, you guys, you were at university, you know something special. <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, well, now, we're doing exactly the same thing you're doing, but I think to myself, it's because we're walking with God now. That's why our grain is so much higher than yours. <laughs> if you would do the same thing, then your grain would also be better. You see, once a Christian boy, everything will go just great. And I was quite happy to be out of the university, and we moved out to this place, and we started this whole thing going. And then the, our money was all invested in the land and we had invested lots more money on loans and things for whatever is necessary to put in the wheat crops and all this sort of thing. And then a flock of birds arrived such as you have never seen in your entire life. And they ignored all the farms with the little wheats on them, <laughs> but they sat on mine and made it home and they were just stubbles. And then, you name it, it went wrong. Sanctions came in against South Africa at that time. The economy was totally destroyed. Interest rates that had been at 3 and 4 percent shot up to 28, 30, 36 percent in some cases. And loans that were nothing to repay became a total nightmare. And the only means of making money was taken away, and we were totally destroyed. Everything I ever possessed was gone with a wave of a wand. It just ran through my fingers. And all the crutches that I'd been leaning on were gone. And the birds ate my fields. And I said to God, how can you do this to me? How can you destroy me? How can you allow this to happen? And I have no means of supporting myself. I have nothing. My scientific credibility is zero. I can never go back to my previous job. I'm finished. And it got worse. And it got worse. And eventually we had nothing left. No food, no nothing. And my wife and I and the children, we sat down and we talked about it and we decided if this was the truth, and I don't believe that all the things that had happened were from the other side. You see, when I made my decision, that child of mine had changed. He became a totally different child. Whereas before, he wasn't sick, but he had a dark, somber look in his face. He changed to such an extent that he became the sweetest, nicest child in our entire home. He became a pleasure to live with. And I knew that what had happened before was a ruse. I know the Bible says Belzebub wouldn't drive out Belzebub. But what had happened in my house is that he wasn't driven out by Belzebub. When the Catholic Church had come and done its thing, Satan had told his demons, stand back. And when you stand back and allow the child to lie back and relax, they will be ensnared twice as much as they were before. And it happened. But after we made our decision, this child was completely cured. He is the most spiritual of all my children. And he is so different that I knew that it had to be from God. It was a totally different ball game. The other interesting thing that happened was 
that same Catholic priest, after all this time, more than a year, out of the blue, while I was wrestling with this decision, phoned me. And I picked up the phone and I said, Hi. And he says, I'm Father so-and-so. And I said, Yes, that's strange. Why are you calling me? And he said to me, You know your father who is dead? Your father is having terrific problems out there in purgatory. It's true, he said that. And I said to him, but uh, how do you know? Having done the study on the state of the dead and all these things and knowing what happened, I said to him, how do you know? He says, the nuns that never see the world, they have been told by the other side that your father is in trouble and he is in trouble because of you. And you had better get back to the church quickly. And you had better start praying and having masses said so that this problem will go away. And I said, thank you very much for the information and put the phone down and remember thinking, you're too late, devil. You are too late. That man was a nice man. And he is deceived, I know. And the Lord will hopefully lead him to a better life and a better understanding one day. But here I was on this farm with no money, no means, no nothing, destroyed career, no chance of getting back, ostracized, laughing stock of, the, of the, the academic world, and no money. And we knelt down and we claimed every promise in the Bible and said, Lord, you have promised you will take care of all our needs. You have promised that the children of a righteous man will never be seen begging in the street. There is no way out of the dilemma that we have. There is no money, there is no food, there is nothing. But we believe your promises. And we wrote a letter, and we put it down in writing, all the promises, and said, you cannot lie, therefore these promises must be for us. And if our life out here is destroyed and our farm is destroyed, then so be it. There must be something else that you have in mind. And then we went to bed. And the next morning at 8 o'clock, the phone rang, and a professor from another university phoned me and said, one of his colleagues has got a major problem and has to go away and has to take extended leave for a year. And they need someone to replace immediately, and the subject being taught is exactly the same field that I was in. And I said to him, well, what do you want me to do? He says, well, you could come and give the classes. And I said to him, but you know, what about, uh, what about, uh, he says, never mind, as long as you stick with science and who cares, it doesn't matter. You come and would you do that for us? We're in a jam and we need someone and we know that you're available. And I said, well, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, when, when do I start? And he says, well, we'd have to get it through the committees and probably in three months' time. And I said, okay, thank you very much. Put the phone down and said, nice try, God, but in three months' time, I'm dead meat. I've got nothing to eat. <laughs> and I was so depressed. And then about 20 minutes to half an hour later, the phone rings again, and it's the same man. And he says to me, Something strange just happened. I said, what happened? He said, I went to the rector's office to have him sign this thing so we can start the ball rolling. And the rector says, I have no time. I have no time for committees to call them together to get the process rolling. What is it you want? And I explained to him what I want, that I have to replace it. And he said, ah, come here, I'll sign it. And he signed it and he said, appoint the man. He can come tomorrow if he has to. <laughs> so I said, wow. So when do I start? It was, it was Thursday. And, he, and he, then he said, Monday. You start Monday. I said, I start Monday? And I was in another little town, and I had a farm, and there were cows. I was bankrupt. And who was going to take care of these stupid cows on the farm? And 10,000 problems to be solved in one weekend. Impossible. And I put the phone down, and I said to my wife, I've got a university job. Only for a year, probably, but it's okay. We've got something to go to. I start Monday, but who's going to take care of the rest? So, 
we prayed. And we said, Lord, you have one solution. Surely you, knowing everything, must have the other solutions. And we had hardly finished when there was a knock on the door and a young couple arrived. And this young couple said that they were farmers in another country to the north of South Africa. And they were Seventh-day Adventists. And they had been working for another farmer, and he had told them if they are not prepared to work on the Sabbath, they must go, and it kicked them off the farm. So he had lost his job because he kept the Sabbath. And he said to me, I've got nowhere to live, I've got nowhere to stay. I said, Do you, would you like to live on this farm? And he said, sure. <laughs> and I said, uh, I can't pay you anything. Uh, he says, that's okay. You don't have to pay me anything. I'll, can I live here? I said, sure, you can live here. And whatever you sell from the milk, you can keep that for yourself. And I thought I would pay the interest of all the loans that I have with my salary. And it was solved within 24 hours. There was a man on the farm who wanted to live there for nothing and take care of the farm and live off the proceeds. And I had a job at the university. And I went to this university and I started teaching. And for the first few weeks, of course, I had no salary, no money. Also, another miracle within that same period, I got a house in the middle of a month and I didn't have to pay till the end of the month. My kids went to school and they got clothing, school clothes, they wear uniforms in my country, all the clothes, all the sizes, we put it on the bill at the end of the month. But I had not one cent to even buy a little bit of food to carry on. And then I got into the car, and I don't tell people that I'm in financial trouble. I got into the car and I was driving around and we been driving the last bit of gas was just about going and my daughter says what's this here and she picks up 150 rand that then was the equivalent of about 150 dollars in the back she says it's lying on the floor and the next week there were another 150 I don't know how it got into the car but it kept us going until my first salary check arrived now I can tell you this is the real truth. There were times when we had very hard times, when we had virtually no money. All my money went into interest payments, interest payments. And there were times when we really ran out and had no food whatsoever. And I remember one day sitting around a table with no food, praying to the Lord and thanking Him for what we were about to receive. And this is the truth. When there was a ring on the door, and we went outside and there was no one, but there was a basket full of food on the floor. And this is a fact. I want to tell you something, that if you know the living God, your road might not be a rose garden. You might not have the best of everything you need, but your water and your bread will be sure and he will take care of you. While I was at that university, I was only teaching for three months when riots broke out within the university. There was such chaos in my country. There were riots everywhere. The rector ordered postponement of the exams. And then it didn't fit the timetable. Table. Somehow it didn't fit. And one day had to write earlier. And all my exams were on that day. And this... Uh, Head of department called me in then and I, I said to him, what must I do now? I've finished here. I've done everything that I must do. And for six weeks there's nothing going on, just riots in this, on this campus, no exams. I've got no exams coming. What must I do? He says, go away, go to the moon for all I care and come back in six weeks. And in the meantime, somebody had arranged for me to go away for six weeks to the United States and to other places to look at all the petrified forests and things in the world. And I'd say to him, forget it, it's impossible, I've just started a job, I can't go and tell the man I want to go away for six weeks. And there were the six weeks. And I could go on the study tour, you saw many of the slides here. I could tell you one story after the other. I could keep you busy all night. I want to tell you that the Lord intervened with such power in our lives. And as we 
went through life again, back at the university, they started respecting me for the science that I was doing. And eventually I was given a permanent position. And eventually I started right at the bottom again. I was senior lecturer, here I was just a lecturer. And eventually I became a lecturer and then a professor and head of department. In spite of what I believe, in spite of what I say. So if you think that God cannot take care of you, I want to tell you, He can do anything. I am in a secular university. I'm a professor and head of a zoology department in a secular university. I teach and preach creationism, which is impossible in terms of human imagination. And in spite of it, I have that position. Never be afraid to stand up for the Lord and for his truth. If you are genuine, God will take care of all your needs. I don't know whether it will be forever. Sooner or later, someone will close the tap. But it doesn't matter. The Lord will have something else. And he is offering the same to every single one of you. Take a step for what is right. Do what is right. And the Lord will fulfill every one of his promises. Thank you.